the talk I'm going to give flows out of one simple and remarkable fact, which is that all of us and the Milky Way galaxy that we inhabit are currently in motion at a substantial fraction of the speed of light. Now, we've known this since 1917. Those of you who suffered my lunchtime talk yesterday will have heard some of the, the history of uh, Vesta Slipher, who's a great hero of mine, and his early pioneering galaxy spectroscopy. So when he started measuring galaxy redshift, he realized there was a dipole signal on the sky which could be interpreted as the motion of the Milky Way for several hundred kilometers a, a second. And today, of course, we see that exquisitely in the sky distribution of microwave background radiation. So why is this velocity there? W where did it come from? What use can we make of it? So what I'm going to try and do is, is just give a little overview of, of, of some of the technology that we use to, to describe this field. Um, particularly focusing on the idea that peculiar velocities, the, the motion of galaxies with respect to everybody else, could be used as an insight into whether Einstein's theory of gravity is the correct one. I'll emphasize that, although you can do a certain amount analytically, really you need numerical simulations to recover complicated survey data that we now deal with. And I'll show you some new results from a little bit of look into the future at the end. So the velocities are there because gravity causes structure in the universe to collapse. So here's a few slices out of an n-body simulation, which obviously should be expanding, so one freezes that out. Um, small fluctuations in density at high redshift become larger towards the present. And you can see that matter drains out of the low-density regions, falls on to the high-density regions. So everything is, is, has to be in motion just to preserve matter. A few bits of notation. Uh, we will, oh, let's say I'd press the wrong button. <laughs> it should be further apart. Uh, we're talking about a, a fluctuating density field. So um, delta will be a dimensionless number that tells you the, the fraction of deviations of density from the homogeneous value. We often describe this in Fourier space. So um, for example, the variance in density fluctuations will just be the sum over the power of the Fourier modes. And it's often convenient to put this in a dimensionless form, multiplied by three powers of the wave number. And then you have the contribution to the variance per log of it range of scales. It's a natural way to write this, I think. Although Fourier space has its counterpart in configuration space, we'll often be interested in the autocorrelation function of the, uh, of the density field. So alternative ways of describing the density, is, and these are all related to each other, either in terms of the, the gravitational potential or the, today's target, the peculiar velocity. So peculiar velocity has to be there, as I showed uh, visually, just by continuity. There'll be a peculiar velocity u and its divergence will give you the time derivative of the density fluctuation. So if you rewrite that a little bit, you can show the divergence of the peculiar velocity is proportional to the density fluctuation itself um, times a factor which is our prime target, f sub g. It's the logarithmic growth rate of the density fluctuation with respect to the cosmic scale factor. And a good approximation for this is about the 0.6 power of the density parameter. So if the universe had critical density, that is, it was neither closed um, nor open, then fg would be 1. In other words, density fluctuations grow in proportion to the size of the universe. But since we believe from many observations that omega matter is about 0.3, then this growth rate should be about 0.4. So we'd like to measure that and, and test it. Now, alternatively, you can express things in terms of the gravitational potential, which um, phi should obey Poisson's equation sourced by the density fluctuation delta. And phi is very important in cosmology because where the fluctuations are, are weak, that is phi on c squared is small, as we know it is. This number is about 10 to the minus 5, typically. These represent the fluctuations in the metric, the deviations from the, the uniform Robson-Walker form. <laughs> and if the velocity field is, is irrotational, as it should be, well, then the velocity should be writable as a gradient of the potential, and indeed that potential is proportional to the gravitational field. So all of this you can sum up very straightforwardly in Fourier space, which is that if you have the uh, Fourier components of the density field, you divide by k squared, and you have the Fourier components of the potential, and you divide by k, and you have the components of the peculiar velocity. 
So what does this look like? Let's look at the, at the power spectrum. This is for the standard model, the um, lambda cold out matter model, so 70% vacuum energy or something similar to it, 30% cold out matter. So here's the dimensionless power I promised. Um, for reasons I'll explain in a second, these there's a curve and redshift decreases because it expands the gravitational instability and increases the power, which you can calculate by linear perturbation theory and on small scales where you're above the linear regime. Um, simulations are necessary to figure out what it actually does. But on large scales, linear theory works. But a better way of expressing this perhaps is in terms of the, the, the metric fluctuations potential. Um, so here's the same thing. And we now we see the, the metric fluctuations are diving off. But they're tending towards something that's nearly constant at low K. And indeed, these dotted lines here are the C fluctuations that are injected by inflation or whatever the correct theory of initial position is. And we know now that they're slightly red tilted, a very nearly scale invariant. And they change weakly with redshift. And this is one of the implications of, of the fact that the universe is vacuum energy dominated, that the metric fluctuations are damped away as the universe starts to lose its domination by matter. But the bigger damping, of course, is the high K fluctuations. Their growth is held back when the universe is, is radiation dominated. So for a variety of reasons, you only access the primordial metric fluctuations at extremely large scales. Anyway, but let's go to velocity. And you tilt that thing. And what you find, indeed, is that the few hundred stomps in the second peculiar motion of the Milky Way makes perfect sense. So take the square root of this. You get an RMS of a few hundred kilometers a second. And it peaks here at about k of 0 0.06, so 100 megaparsec radii. So extremely large scale structures in the universe are sorted at that peculiar motion. So that's very nice, because it means these velocities are a good probe of linear scales. And nonlinear perturbations down here are, are subdominant. All right, so for a long time, we couldn't do anything with any of this, because the requisite data for the velocities were absent. Throughout up to the, the end of the 1970s, the best you could do was look at the sky and measure the fact that galaxies were not uniformly distributed. Redshift surveys really got going in the 1980s. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen this, this iconic diagram. And they were made, of course, assuming that the Hubble expansion is exact, that the distance is precisely at low redshift proportional to the redshift. But of course, that's not correct. In detail, the peculiar velocities add to the apparent redshift. So this, uh, some details of, of this picture are not particularly correct, but uh, more of that shortly. Anyway, you might wonder, though, whether you could just get on and figure out what the peculiar velocity field was directly. And for a long time, this was something that people had a good go at. And you can do it if you have distance indicators. So um, the peculiar velocity is the radial velocity you observe minus what it should be, Hubble constant time to distance. And you can infer distances, uh, for example, by using the standard Cannell technique with, with whole galaxies, the fundamental plane, and Tommy Fisher and so on. And so that means, in, in principle, if you can measure u, you can take its divergence, um, you can find the growth rate times the density fluctuation. If you observe the density fluctuation directly, you can find the growth rate. The problem is, of course, that you're only sensitive to the radial component of the peculiar motion, not the transverse one. Um, but a, a, a neat solution was cooked up for this by Stecken and Birchinger. Uh, so you, you, if the peculiar velocity is right towards the gradient of a potential, you can figure out that potential just by integrating the thing that you can see along the radial direction. And having got the potential, you then get the full velocity field <coughs> and thus estimate the density times the growth rate. Now, the galaxies you're dealing with are biased traces of the overall dark matter. So when delta is small, you linearize galaxy formation. And the observed fluctuation in numbers is from number b times delta. And so the thing that's observable in all of this is that you basically calculate the peculiar velocities, infer the density fluctuation, plot it against the density. That's it. You plot it against the density fluctuation you see in a number of galaxies. The slope of that line should be beta, which is 
growth rate divided by B. So this was a great industry throughout the 1990s. Um, and it was hugely influential at its time. And particularly with galaxy thrust with the infrared by the ARAS satellite. Beta came out large, over one. And this, at the time, this was before people came to realize the universe was vacuum dominated. There was a big tendency to want to believe in the simplest cosmological model, the Einstein de Sitter and the mass equals one universe. And this looked like it was strong evidence. So um, <coughs> unfortunately, that was not the, 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 the correct conclusion. Partly that was because I think people didn't realize that B could be significantly less than one for IR galaxies. So the, their fluctuations were more uniform than the fluctuations of the matter. But really, it's because these distance indicators are very coarse. The Pellet issue gives you something like 20%. So it's a huge scattering. It's, it's difficult to model that and get accurate results. So you need a better way. Um, and here is the better way. It's Nick Kaiser, who is one of the great cosmologists. I'm very proud to say is, is a good friend. Uh, he's also a, a completely nutty long-distance runner, which I am not. But so I, I struggle to keep up with him any time we, we go up a mountain. So in, he blew this field apart in 1987 with a, a simple paper pointing out that the Tudor velocity should give us characteristic anisotropies in the, in the pattern of galaxy clustering. You can see in this simple spherical model. So if you were, imagine you have shells of matter that are falling in. So a, a particle here, you place closer to the, the zero axis here because it has a compared to the peculiar velocity away from us. So structures in the linear regime tend to be flattened, but if these velocities become too large and nonlinear, they turn inside out. So this is what we see when you try to infer this. Um, Kaiser also derived a very simple and powerful formula, which uh, I, I know what it's like. And every time you see a slide with algebra on, even when you're young, never mind when you're my age, your heart sinks. But um, just to say what the basic idea is, that you should think of this in, in terms of the some sort of displacement field. So the particle position is where it started off, and the inhomogeneity is move it a little bit. And so the divergence of that displacement field is what gives you the density fluctuation. And the apparent displacement you get is basically the true one, which you scale up by B, if it's galaxies you're looking at, plus an extra displacement in the, the line of sight map. So you put all that together in Fourier space, and you have a a quadrupolar distortion. So the, the Fourier space component seen in redshift space is the true one times B plus the growth rate times mu squared. So mu is just the cosine of the angle of the line of sight of the mode you're dealing with. Mu is one of the, the wave vectors coming towards you. So there's a quadrupolar distortion in the clustering pattern. And if you measure that, you can read off the growth rate. It seems like a great idea. If that's a bit abstract, let's see what it looks like in the real world. Here's a, a simulated galaxy redshift survey, uh, the 2DF galaxy survey, which you, many of you will have heard of. And this is done in real space. So it's in inhomogeneous galaxy distribution with everything placed at its genuine radial distance. So now we turn on the peculiar velocities. And you get this. So you can see the Kaiser effect in terms of they pick a supercluster that one, and you see it bodily moves by the long wavelength model, it's 100 megaparsec moves, the moving whole superclusters. But also you see the tight knots and the clusters of galaxies explode into radius stretches. And these are the so-called fingers of God, random orbital motions which virilize within a structure to cause that. And these are one of the complications of extracting the, the interesting Kaiser signal. So what does it look like in, in the real universe? So here is the, the, uh, the local galaxy distribution as seen by the 2DF. And although this is getting old now, it's still actually the highest fidelity picture we have of local large scale structure. So the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, like which I'm sure you all know, is really concentrated on more sparsely sampling the, the distribution of, of galaxies at higher redshifts. But this is everything there is at those air out to 20 or so. So you, you analyze this by looking at the, um, the correlation function. 
but dissected in so one's counting pairs of galaxies and looking for excess pairs indicating clusters. And you do this as a function, not at a radial separation, but in a transverse and separation along the line of sight. And then what you find is that the contours of this function are not circular symmetric, as they would be in the absence of zero velocities. But at large separations, they're flattened, which is a Kaiser effect. At small separations, they're blown apart by the changes of shape. So we were very pleased we were able to make you know, an accurate measurement of this effect for the, for the first time and see these, these two contributions and use it to estimate the growth rate, which in those days was seen under the growth rate is approximately the 0.6 power of the density parameter. So this was a way of measuring the energy of the universe, which was just really interesting back in 2000. So things move on now. So the density parameter is known. And Sean Cole, the, uh, one of the, the leading people in the CDF team, said to me in despair almost a few years ago, I've spent my whole life dominated by the question of measuring the density parameter. And now it's done. I don't know what to do anymore. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was exciting when, when things like that weren't actually known. Anyway, so we know the density parameter. So <laughs> what use is any of this? Well, it may be useful, depending on if you compare the correct theory of gravity. For years, everybody just assumed without questioning GR was the correct description of the, the perfect cosmology. Um, but how do, we, how do we know that, particularly with the, the Lambda CDM model, the dark energy dominated universe? It only comes, we only infer this from knowing the expansion history of the universe. So the, the Hubble parameter is a function of time or redshift. Now we compare that to Friedman's equation, which basically says the square of the Hubble parameter is proportional to something that depends on the curvature, which seems to be zero plus the matter center. And we can't match the data unless there's an additional term here, which is vector components. So we infer the existence of you know, dark energy. Or maybe the equation was wrong to start with. So how do we know that dark energy really exists as a physical substance? <laughs> well, if, it's, if the acceleration of the universe is driven just by having the incorrect theory of gravity, we've got to get somehow from the theory of gravity that obtained by the theory of the cosmos what seems very accurately to be Einstein gravity in the scale of the solar system. And so that's a motivation for, for using things like the growth rate as, as a test. So the way you can try and uh, formalize this is thinking about, again, metric fluctuations. So here, here's the metric. Let's imagine the time part and the space part suffer some weak perturbations between psi and phi. In the standard picture, those two would be the same. That's why we have a factor two in the, in the formula for light deflection compared to naive Newtonian arguments. And that potential would be the Newtonian potential in the base plus Planck equation. So therefore, it's pretty obvious how you can generalize this. You want to try to allow the two potentials to be different and measure the relation between them. And that requires observations of this you know, gravitational lensing, light deflection. Um, and you can effectively allow the gravitational constant in, in Platon's equation to be different from its standard value on the scales that we can access in these sort of cosmological studies, that is intermediate between the whole cosmos and small here-today scales, which is the 100 megaparsec scale of the extreme velocity scale. So some combination of this slip, as it's called, the relation between the potentials and the varying g gives you this, this thing that we can measure, the growth rate. So if we measure something that's non-standard, combined with lensing, it can tell us that gravity is, is not as Einstein described. Um, okay, so I, I more equations, which I put up just to, to frighten you, because although I talked about the linear Kaiser distortion, I showed you in the embodied simulation that these things are more complicated than reality. So you need a kind of non-linear model to extract the interesting growth rate from the, uh, um, the data. And this is a huge industry. And every year, the papers get longer. And my heart sinks more every time I, I open one of them. Um, so we started off up here with Kaiser's simple formula with a, with, with a quadrupole. And to cope with that, I can cope with adding this Lorentzian expression, which damps away the modes at high values of k mu, that is the ones 
with a short wavelength running along the line of sight when the effective light is in the god. Beyond that, you run into expressions that, that attempt to use perturbation theory to calculate nonlinear effects. It's hard to follow the calculations for me. It's hard to compute them in a way that you know numerically is robust. Fortunately, for a whole pile of reasons, I, you know, I feel that this is not necessary. Um, one, well, two of them are that uh, a lot of this is all focused on describing the dark matter field, the view interested in galaxies. And secondly, a lot of it is predicting something it doesn't need to predict. That is, that these perturbation theory expressions try to compute not only the anisotropy of the correlation function, but its absolute value. Now, both of these are affected by nonlinear methods. But the absolute value is directly observable. I mean, Wedge's space correlation can be projected in such a way that they're independent of the scheme of velocity. So s some of this is, is trying to predict something that it doesn't need to. There's no point. You can only get it wrong. So um, oh, I think there was a nice paper by Julianne Aquan in 2012 that just emphasized that as far as the dark matter field is concerned, a lot of these prescriptions, despite all the effort involved in generating, didn't work too well. So um, my inclination is just to ride roughshod over this and say, well, look, we have big computers. They have nothing better to do except make accurate simulations of possible nonlinear dynamics of gravitational collapse. And once we've done that, we can probably insert galaxies in them in a way that it would be very difficult to achieve analytically. So um, let's, let's talk about how we put galaxies in. Of course, galaxy formation is an unsolved problem that will always be with us at some level. So again, people try very hard with exact hydrodynamics, which is subject to solid star formation. But it's easier and perhaps more robust to take an empirical approach, which is, um, which is the halo model, which simply says, and in a sense, it's a very old picture going back to the 1950s. Nyman and Scott talked about thinking about the density field as a superposition of clumps. And, and those clumps naturally generate clusters, which all galaxies live in clumps. They didn't know about dark matter halos, which spontaneously condense out of n-body simulations, but here they are. And we have good analytic descriptions, the NFW profile, the low density profile. So all we need to do is insert galaxies in them and with some radial law, which we can infer empirically. And we can get a simulation populated with galaxies, which serves as the basis for accurate mock data that we can analyze the degrees of view interest. Um, so here's just a, an indication of how well the HALO model works. Now it allows us to understand the nonlinearities in the in the density field. So it's a, at low k, fluctuations you see are dominated by linear theory. That is, halos are not placed at random. They're brought together by the large wavelength modes. But you have extra correlated pairs on small scales, which are contributed on different scales by halos of different masses. So low mass halos contributed on small scales, high mass halos on large scales. You put the whole thing together, and you get the nonlinear curvature. Yeah, but the, the HALO model gives us a good description, a, a compact description of what comes out of n-body simulations, and it allows us to turn that into a simulated galaxy distribution. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, I, I don't think one would have predicted in advance that this worked, but anyway, if it works, it, it works. Um, and so the HALO model then consists of, uh, of, of just um, taking the halos and having an occupation dis description. So it's sort of a function of the halo mass. Low mass halos presumably don't have enough material to s host a galaxy. So the numbers of galaxies in them are rarely as high as one. Beyond a certain point, you get one galaxy, central galaxy, and then as the halo gets more massive, you've got enough ma material left over to build up satellites. So there's a full prescription. Yeah, we've got the Milky Way, we've got the Magellanic Cloud. Yes, well, e exactly. This depends. 
this curve would change according to what, whatever luminosity of the galaxy you thought you were dealing with. Okay, so this would be cut for galaxies that are rather more luminous than the Milky Way. And if you if you wanted to do this for dwarf galaxies, this curve would shift to the left. So there's always a cut on mass. No, no. Well, it, it's it's if you if you if you make a luminosity limited sample cut to a particular luminosity, then such a curve exists, and it changes according to what kind of galaxy you're trying to model. But the point is, it can be done empirically. So, right. What I just said is that um, in principle you can do all this. So there are there are a few problems to do with practical limitations of of, of computing the necessary cosmology. One is that a simulation is big, that, sorry, the universe is big, and the surveys of it occupy large volumes, and the computational volume has to match this, therefore. And therefore, inevitably, you, you lack resolution on small mass scales. So we don't find the lowest mass halos, some of which we need if we're trying to simulate dwarf galaxies on the survey. Um, furthermore, every time you change your cosmological parameters, you need to run the simulation again. So that rapidly gets really painful. So what you need is a, is a way of getting around these. Um, so I'm going to show you some, some quick, dirty tricks that allow you to run a single simulation and overcome these problems. So let's deal with the, uh, the low mass problem, first of all. Um, apart from register space distortions, Kaiser also figured out back in 1984 that bias depends on mass. So um, that is different dark matter halos have a bias parameter that depends on their mass. The very high mass objects are extremely rare. The probability of their formation is heavily perturbed by underlying large magnetic mode, and their bias is large. As the, as the mass gets smaller, bias actually becomes below one, so the very lowest mass halos are anti-bias. But the point is in a predictable way. So if you have a simulation where you only find the most, most massive dark matter halos, and the small ones are lost, you can, you can recover them because you can invert this equation to go from the observed fluctuations in the high mass halos to the mass fluctuation, and then you bias it again to take a different B. So Sylvain de la Torre and I wrote, wrote a paper doing this, which um, let me just show you how, how it works. So here are the, the low mass halos, uh, the cut of 10 to 11 solar masses, and this is a reconstruction of their spatial distribution based on only knowing where the, s the halos above 10 to the 12 solar masses are. Okay, so the mass, and we showed that the, the overall correlation is taking the observed halos plus the reconstructed low mass halos with a for adequate precision matches what you would have got with, with, with the precise signature. So this resolution limit can be overcome, and this we've made use of this effect. For the question of how to yeah, that's right. Well, it's true to a good level of approximation. So, what, what system were you thinking about? Right, but it's. I mean, it, this this just shows you. I mean, who cares about assembly bias from, from the point of view of the dark matter distribution? All right. So now it's now it's a question of yeah. I think it's less of a problem with the, with the low masses because these are the things. Well, these are the things that, that house the dwarf galaxies. Right? They're all actively star forming today. So you're not you're not talking about having a distribution of galaxies that sometimes formed at high redshift and switched off. Anyway, that's an interesting point for discussion. So how do we deal with simulating many cosmologies, marching through a cosmological parameter space, and not having to re-simulate every time? Um, well, Raoul Angelo and Simon White had a good suggestion about how to deal with this in 2010, um, where they, they they made the following point. I mean, one I showed you this plot before. Uh, so here's the power spectrum evolving with time, and these dashed lines represent what one sees in n-body simulations. Now, when you stop and think, and, and we, we always say, oh, well, we, we simulated a, a cube of the universe one gigaparsec on the side. 
I think, well, how does the computer know that this cube is supposed to be one gigaparsec? Now, as far as it's concerned, it's one in physical units. And you associate a length with that, and what, what length you choose to associate is up to you. So actually, I could equally well take the, the, the x-axis here and move it transversely by any amount as I wanted. Similarly, I said that um, this line is redshift zero. Well, again, the computer doesn't know what time really is. It's just a particular output. I could call this one redshift zero. So you have the ability to move horizontally and vertically at will and call that uh, a new simulation. And when you think about it, then at the quasi-linear point where uh, linear theory and the truth are departing, you have an ability to match the amplitude and the tangent slope of the power spectrum, which means basically you get the math function of dark matter halos correct. So you give me a target cosmology, I can take a simulation of a completely different cosmology, scale it horizontally and vertically, and produce the, the mass functions I would get in the target cosmology. On very large wavelengths, you've probably messed up the shape of the spectrum, but you can fix that because you just, if it's in the linear regime, you add an additional displacement to it, and now the overall power spectrum is completely correct. So you have now a nonlinear mass distribution that's characteristic of completely different cosmologies. So this was very nice, and um, I had a, a smart student called Alex Mead, now graduated, and we dug into trying to turn this into a practical algorithm. And one of the problems is, well, the, the problem of practicality is size. So with the kind of state-of-the-art simulations that you're talking about, you may have a terabyte of particle data sitting around, which you know, is not, not trivial to, uh, to copy from someone's computer to yours. And more to the point, people don't make it available. There are big um, public domain simulation efforts for the multi-dark database. All they publish, all they make available openly, is the catalogs of dark matter halos. So you let to wonder, well, can you do anything just with the halo catalog without having to process the particle data? And the answer is you can. Um, and moreover, when we were doing this, we realized you could actually improve on angular and white in, in, in two ways. I mean, one is the additional displacement to it that angular and white apply automatically supplied to the particle data, and therefore it transports all halos by the same amount. But if you think back a few slides, halos should be biased according to their mass. And so the effective displacement field you need to give to the halos is a function of mass. And if we're working for the halos, we can do that trivially, and therefore ensure the correct linear regime structure for the, the halos in the, in the reconstructed density field is present. And angular and white get that wrong. Also, you can rebuild the halos in terms of their internal structure, because if you change the cosmology, the detailed density contrast just sort of collapses to alpha. So when you're working with the particle data, you can't, you can't attend to that. So actually, apart from dealing with a, a data set that's well, sort of at least a thousand times smaller than the raw particle data, um, you, can, you can do a better job. So let me illustrate how this works, and I'll do it as a kind of extreme case. Uh, we made a simulation of something that once used to be popular. Anybody, <laughs> not you, but anybody else know what the, f no, no, no. Um, no, it's <laughs> no t, t was tau. Um, so this was an einstein de Sitter cosmology that was given an extra radiation content so that the, uh, the shape of the power spectrum was characteristic of a low-density universe. So this was a desperation that people went to in the, well, even in the early 1990s to try and escape the obvious conclusion that lambda is very weak. So it has, um, and it's CDM only, so it has no baryon acoustic oscillations. It doesn't have lambda. So it's as different from the real world as, as, as you could wish, and yet you can turn it into the real world. So this is what it looks like visually, this the halo catalog. This is what you start with. Um, you pick an output of different redshifts, and you can see that higher redshifts are things a bit less clustered. You reassign a new box size, and then you re-simulate the whole thing, starting with the same phases, but now doing lambda CDM. And here's the halo catalog that this produces. So visually, it doesn't look too bad, right? Uh, so let's, let's, let's dig into this a bit more quantitatively. So here's how it works. This is the angle of white 
that it uh, you have the power spectrum um, the power CDM spectrum looks like this you move to a different redshift and then you rescale which gives you a, the green line which almost overlies um, the target but you can see there's a residual of course that residual is, is VAO so this gives you the power spectrum of, of the, uh, the difference which, which yields the, uh, the addition of the spectral fields you have to apply and as a result then you have something that has VAO in it and looks like lambda CDM um, so how does this work for, for halos themselves so just look at the residual it's the, it's the same basic idea if you if you do the, the rescaling you end up with the, the green VAO residual if you do what Angular and White would have you do which is calculate an additional displacement field and apply it to the halos you still have about half of the VAO signal left and that's because the mass dependent bias has not been correctly reproduced whereas if you put that in you get the blue line which at that kind of 1% level gives you what you wanted so this really works that's in real space and this talk of course is about redshift space um, so here's a alternative pretty picture way of looking at the, the redshift space uh, I showed you before redshift space correlation function this is the redshift space power spectrum done as a function of k here and mu the angle to line of sight here where the size of distortion says that things should gain a quadratic mu squared boost going on here for example and this is lambda CDM target this is the, um, the real scaled thing to a casual glance they look identical so what, uh, what you should look at is what you actually use to, to measure the linear distortion which is the, um, the quadrupole moment and the, and the monopole in, in redshift space so you can measure the ratio of those so um, G just denotes the quadrupole to monopole ratio and here it is and out to the sort of wave numbers where you would trust this so about 0.2 it works at the sort of one percent level so this this sort of simulation rescaling can provide you with useful mock universes without having to simulate them um ye ye yes yes and no um i i i, uh, I don't have a slide on, on, the, on this here i mean you, you've got a choice you can either try and predict the things you've done uh, or you can take them directly from, and, and you tend to get that slightly wrong relative to the real simulation. Or you can marginalize over precisely what they are, which is, which is what everybody always does, treat them as a nuisance parameter. Um, yeah. So it's magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, the particles... I mean, lam lambda has no gravitational effect on the particles, right? They're just pulled by the, the matter. No, no, no. You get the you get the right f at the end because you you sorry, I, I didn't say it clear enough. You rescale the large scale velocities according to the. Yeah, the, yeah. Sorry, I should have said that. Um, last extension of this, which 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 I think is particularly interesting. That, you know, if we're doing this to test gravity then really it, it ought to be necessary to, to see what the universe looks like in what, what one has meant by gravity models. So a you know, number of groups around the world are, are, are taking a popular mod modification of gravity, say the FFR model, if you've heard of that, and making detailed nonlinear simulations. So you might wonder whether this sort of rescaling process can actually match those approximately as well. Because it's nice to have data that, that compare real gravity with mock gravity and, and show that you can tell the difference. Um, but basically, we, we've had a go at this. And it works not quite as well. Um, or it works at um, more like 5% rather than 1%, which is okay for current precision, but in the future it won't be. And the sort of things you have to do to, um, to generalize this, characteristic features of, of nonlinear of, of modified gravity, are two really. First of all, the growth rate itself, instead of just being some universal number with FG, now depends on scale in a way that's, that's predictable with linear perturbation theory or given theory. So you have to put that in. Um, 
with when you when you're calculating your, your, your additional displacement in the area. Secondly, um, if you're trying to calculate the, the internal properties of halos, you have to allow for the fact that the gravity within them is shielded. So shielding is a characteristic feature of many features of modified gravity. That is, at high in high density regimes like here in the solar system, you don't see the modifications of gravity. And you have to deal with such theories because otherwise history will be ruled out. Um, and so in, in terms of cosmology, what this means is that those of you who deal with this sort of thing will recognize a threshold for collapse, delta C. Um, again, normally it's treated as a constant. Now you have to put in the sum part of the dependence on mass. So if you make those modifications, the whole rescaling apparatus actually works pretty well, even to modified gravity theory. Good. Okay, so that's that's all the tools and background. Let's now take a quick flick through some data. I won't spend very long on this. Um, because I've been speaking for 40 minutes, is that right? Somebody paying attention? Okay, so I'll show you briefly a couple of things from, for instance, the Gamma Survey, which is a kind of successor to the, the QDS, which uses the same machinery. It just goes considerably deeper to um, RF 19.8. And we've been observing since, what, um, 2006? And now we've got about 300,000 redshifts. So one of the interesting things that we've done with this is to look at the irregular space distortion split by population. So it's not news that the universe contains red galaxies and blue galaxies um, because they have very different biases. Although FG had better be the same, they're beta numbers. So FG divided by B is very different. So the blue galaxies with less bias have much more substantial uh, irregular space distortion. Uh, it's well, the average redshift is about 0.3. Um, so one can, can model that and extract the value of beta roughly <coughs> consistently from each of them. But what's been of interest is to wonder whether you can do better by having these multiple kinds of galaxies. Because, of course, they all trace the same large-scale structure. Um, they all sit in the same cosmic web, they occupy the same filaments and not the same volume. Now, what limits the precision on a lot of these cosmology statistics is cosmic variance, which means it drives you to having a large volume. But that's really just counting statistics in terms of the large cosmological structures. How many superclusters did you get? Zero, one, or whatever. So if you could suppress co that cosmic variance, you could get a much more precise answer. And so um, McDonald and Selyak had a very interesting suggestion that one could do this. And so we had a go. Uh, let me just skip that. Just, just trust me. You can, you can try to estimate in a way that in principle should be free of cosmic variance. Um, and these show this, well, this is the sort of marginalization you have to do, as we were mentioning. This is the growth rate versus the, um, the pairwise dispersion that characterizes the fingers of God. And if you use the red or the blue galaxies separately, you can estimate parameters on those. If you use them in combination, using the McDonald Selbiak technique, you get small errors, but it's only, it's marginal, it's like 10 or 20%. So suppression of cosmic variance works, but it doesn't work well enough. And that's, and, and, and in retrospect, it's, it's kind of obvious how that should be. Um, yeah, this, this just shows the, uh, the growth rate, and the growth, the growth rate evolves very slowly with redshift. Um, so you have to be careful which redshift you're actually working at. Um, and this is just to show that the, the results come out as, well, I'll show you a better plot shortly with, with, with other estimates of it. Um, they come out consistent with, with, with the standard gravity. The, the problem, though, is, is really shock limits. But um, there's always two sources of, of, of statistical error in these kind of galaxy surveys. Cosmic variance, um, but shock noise from limited numbers of galaxies. So if you lose cosmic variance by this McDonald's cellular technique, you can end up being limited by shock noise. And so you want extremely high number densities in order for us to get the maximum gain. But it's, it's, just, it's just really hard to do this, particularly because 
all the frontier work on, on this kind of issue for the consortium is being done particularly with the kind of dilute tracing that exists at the colonial facilities. So although in principle it's, it gives us a, a kind of improvement, it's rather hard to see how you divide this galaxy. There just aren't enough galaxies in the Ohio number line system. Um, let me just show you briefly the highest redshift retrospect distortions, which have been done by the Vipers survey. So it's kind of uh, um, VLT, well, VIMAS, VLT, lost, lost the object spectrograph. So it's an acronym of acronyms, public spectrographic redshift survey. So this is like 100,000 redshifts taken with the VLT. So it's an eight meter spectroscopy, or I'm not sure, four meter PDF, or two point five meter Sloan. Um, I just mentioned that this is a project that's been led by Gigi Goodson at Milan, and it uses uh, color preselection, so you don't waste time taking redshifts for galaxies below 0.5, so you have a typical mean of 0.9 or so. And it's cosmic rare, but high redshift, well measured. I should mention, of course, all these studies presume that you can deal with the selection error. Just to show with vipers, it's pretty complicated because here um, you have the different quadrants of the, of the CCDs and the, uh, and the uh, objective mass which is a DMOS instrument, and they're not filled in by dithering. So you have this nasty cross pattern on the sky, and the limited numbers of slits means that there's a sampling rate that varies within each one, which correlates with the, with the large mass structure itself. So again, having simulation proves that you can apply these sort of biases and still extract the right signal out of the galaxy. So here is the, the Viper's result for the, for the Christos correlation function. Um, and this used particularly the, the kind of simulation technology I was telling you about, the, um, the ability to fill in the low mass halos of dwarf galaxies. And in the end, we produced a variety of plots like this, showing that the, uh, not only the error bars that we estimated, on the um, on the measure of the growth rate from the survey, were consistent with the spread in in, in, the, in the values that we infer from the number of realizations of mock data, but also the bias was insignificant at the level of one point nine. And, you, and you, you have to do these sort of detailed tests to, to have any sort of credibility. Um, and the details just get worse and worse. So here's the state of the art of this, uh, which I think is fantastic data, but deeply intimidating. It's got the um, luminous red galaxy work from Sloan led by Beth Reed. Um, so to get results at the level of statistical detail that the survey could provide, and here what we're seeing is a function of scale. So we're looking at the monopole and the quadrupole in the, in the correlation function here. Um, this sort of detail had to be taken into account. So here's a simulation arrows show you peculiar velocities of material draining off filaments, building up a halo. And this is a halo that you're going to populate using your occupational description of this galaxy. Now those galaxies have to be given peculiar velocities. At a simple level, the way we used to do this would say, right, one galaxy is sitting dead still at the center, a number of satellites orbiting around with the same description of velocities as dark matter. But in detail, you find the center galaxy has a small velocity dispersion, so you're exaggerated by a factor of 10 relative to the center of mass of the halo. And what's more, that peculiar velocity is, tends to be aligned with the, um, with the general velocity field that's draining onto the halo, which is anisotropic. If you left out this notion, you get completely wrong answers at the level of precision that we need here. If you even just randomized this tiny vector, it turns the green line, well, makes a difference between the truth and the green line. So Reed et al. claimed that they were able to measure the growth rate with a couple of percent precision by doing this, but they had to be exquisitely careful with thinking exactly where the galaxies went in the dark matter distribution. Otherwise, they could have got the wrong answer. So it's a great work, but how you measure a lot better is, is a challenge. Anyway, here we are. Um, I didn't do this deliberately, but the, um, for some reason, the um, not being a Sloan person, the best 
flown in front of me and seemed visible here in yellow. Sorry about that. Whereas the Vipers one is, uh, is um, nice, and, nice and visible out here. Anyway, so at a casual glance, you might think, well, it's, it's all pretty good for standard gravity. On the other hand, some people have, have noted there's a tendency for the, the measurements to be a bit low. Um, there was a paper recently by, um, by Dragon Hutterer that, that pushed on this. I just need to explain one little technicality in doing this. As well as wedge of space distortions, there's another potential source of, of non-circular contours of the correlation function. And that's the so-called occult Pekinsky distortion. And this says that, well, in order to measure the correlation function, you're taking the things we observe, which is angles on the sky and differences in redshift, and trying to transmute them into x, y, z. And, and the cosmological model you choose will change that transmutation. So if you pick an overall geometry that's incorrect, you could get contours of the correlation function that were flattened or extended anyway. So you have to allow for that separately, and this is often s suppressed. Yes, yes. So, um, so here's a nice plot, which, uh, which perhaps should become the standard. That, you know, well, this has been done. So here's a, an occult Pachinsky factor against the, the thing I'm interested in, the growth rate. So you can see there's a correlation, a slight correlation between them. And it's interesting that, uh, you know, so all these ellipses reach the, uh, um, reach the, the promised land. But, well, actually, one of them doesn't. There's two boss analyses, and just maybe people quite know why they're inconsistent with each other. And Hutterer produced this beautifully appallingly colored plot. Um, but, but he tried to do something quite nice. You see, well, I've been selling this as, as the growth rate is much more to do with um, setting modified gravity. But it's tied up with, um, with dark energy as well. So as well as testing Einstein gravity, we want to know, is the dark energy a cosmological constant? Well, of course it is, but we, we want to prove that. Um, and W, the equation of state of dark energy, is literally the minus 1 comes out in two distinct ways. It can be measured geometrically, so the VAO and so on, and it can be measured, it, it also impacts on the growth rate. So Hutterer split out these two different things. So this is basically BAO versus growth rate in different language. And he, he claims it's basically a transmutation of this, but they're offsets in the Y equals XY. Not colossally, but it's a few signals, it's a bit disturbing. So there's an indication that maybe some of the things that that Beth Reed was wrestling with uh, are there in the data and uh, are causing this not quite to gel. Or it could be new physics, but you know, I wouldn't write this off very yet. Anyway, at, at the, I think at the 10% level at least, there's no indication whatsoever of any deviation from the growth rate being expanded. And although there's no space in this talk for saying anything really about gravitational lensing studies, that's also true in their front. So here's a nice study that has been played in Edinburgh by, by Catherine Hamans and, uh, and Fergus Simpson, really just trying on this. Remember, we talked about the two different perturbations, potentials, psi and phi, and how you could move them away from their standard values. So in some combinations that don't need to concern us here, they sit right where they should be with about 10% of the data they have. So at the moment, Gravity looks fine, as, as Einstein made it fine. The question is, will that still be true at 1%? Can we actually measure it um, and model it correctly? So as far as the future is concerned, I'm out of time anyway. Just let me briefly say the next big thing along really will probably be DESI, where it's just going to take over the Kip Peak 4 meter and measure something like um, 30 million galaxies with a, a new 2DF-like position of its many more fibers. Uh, Beyond that, a similar size sample amount, which, which is slightly disappointing. We've all heard of Euclid, I think, um, which will do spectroscopy in an undesirably complicated way by slitless means, dispersing um, the image sky, and so suffering spectrum overlaps and so on. And the, the extra sky noise that that, that engenders means the original target of Euclid, which was a 300 million redshift, which would have been truly revolutionary, is now down to about the same size as, as Desi. At higher redshift, true, but it means if, if W is, is a constant number, it's only going to be a, a factor of root two. 
And this we're going to get, well, who knows when. At the moment, this is scheduled for launch at the end of 2020. And you know, I suspect each one of you will pint a beer, but you know, it hasn't stopped slipping yet. But by 2030, maybe we will have this sort of thing. So we'll, we'll do a great measured dielectric mixture two with these sort of exquisite error bands. And that'll be nice. But I wish we had it now. Anyway, so just to finish, isn't it remarkable to think how far well, this whole journey of galaxy redshift theories has come, starting only 100 years ago with Slipher's work and continuing with some of the greats, but kind of bottoming out as photographic plates reached their limit. But then in about 1980, a kind of Moore's law took hold, a successive um, addition of pieces of technology, you know, digital detectors, um, multiplex spectroscopy, more multiplex spectroscopy going to space pushed up the quantity of redshift. The number of redshifts that we know is doubled every three and a half years. And look up here. Um, that's how many redshifts there would be if we could get the entire sky image to adapt to the Hubble Hyperdeep Field. So we're going to run out of redshifts well, in 2060. It's, it's, it, you know, if, if, you, if you told if you'd shown this curve to people back in, in 1990, it would have seemed incredible. And yet here we are. So thank you for listening. I've tried to sell you these um, halo rescaling methods as a, as a good way of, well, not only in practical terms, quickly generating fake universes, but also just um, pedagogically understanding where the information that we get out of these simulations resides. It's all in the halo catalog. It's going to be really nice. And I've shown you that the data have come a long way, at least at um, the 10% level, Einstein was right. And whether he'll still be right at the 1% level and whether we'll believe it if people claim that he's not, well, 